welcome to Roses All Trash, the accompanying podcast to Read Community, an international reading community which releases monthly reading calendars based off of social justice texts. I'm Catherine. I'm Ryan. Our first text is Victor Karandashev, Romantic Love in Cultural Contexts, and it discusses the way romantic love is perceived culturally in terms of a conflation with passionate and romantic love and the way we correlate obsession and idealization with romantic love and how that prevents us from finding stable relationships. Next is John Madison's One Way Greta Gerwig's Little Women film is Radical. It was published in The Atlantic and it's written by the Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Louisa May Alcott, who is the author of Little Women. Um, but he has a lot of praise for Gerwig's version as a like a full arc fulfillment to Alcott's idea of love. So that's a quote, unlooked for reciprocity, unquote, that takes sacrifice and change, especially for the men of this story, like Lori and like uh, Meg's professor. He is a professor, but he is her husband. It, it also requires indulgence of the people that you love. And one of the most controversial couples in Little Women has always been Joe and Professor Bear, but Gerwig told the story to emphasize that, quote, it is this feeling of being taken seriously that makes all the difference in Joe's affections for Professor Bear, end quote. Kind of building off of last week's topic, last week's idea about, you know, love being the point. This article emphasized for me that, like, ultimately we live life in a continuum between learning to love ourselves and learning to love others. Yeah. Our last reading is by Michael Lerner. It's, to change a society, you must respect its people. It's a chapter in a book written by a leftist rabbi who has a spiritual nonprofit for progressive policy, which uh, the nonprofit is called Tikkun. He writes with a lot of awareness that his spiritual take on politics can encounter resistance. And that actually probably makes him feel more able to insist that justice can't be practiced or rendered without love for each other. Quote, to the extent that we play down this yearning for revolutionary love and the caring society, end quote, the less we'll be able to achieve our visions for like a caring society. I kind of want to start with the discussion of his, his angle, because I think it's really hard not to read our biases into this type of like intangible topic. For example, like whenever Lerner writes about love and forgiveness across race and gender, that's really hard for me to accept silently. Like I can take that kind of conversation, but it's hard for me to accept without voicing my, like voicing caveats. But when he talks about forgiveness across religions and across secularism, I find myself really agreeing because I am Christian and because I totally identify with his idea that like it makes no sense for such a huge body of people as the religious, uh, any religion to be judged for the actions of a few. You know, like I think with intangible topics like this, our biases really come out. So uh, there's a lot of problems with learners approach. And I'm willing to say that it's a problem with his phrasing as opposed to a problem with his actual philosophy. But it, it kind of goes back to that idea we were talking about um, in the episode, America and the racial imagination. It's hard to hear, even though a lot of it is kind of ultimately true and eventually might become true. So since this episode is on love as power, I was wondering if you think that kind of power filled love is even accessible at this point at this point in our society with its division i think it's really hard for that it's accessible but it's hard for it to be accessible on the large scale necessarily necessary to cause systematic change i understand to a degree what it's like to experience that type of like powerful love and the type of motivation and sense of capability that it grants you but I've I've seen that on very small, like on community scale. I don't want to say small because that makes it sound lesser. It's not lesser, but it's just like a literally a smaller number of people on a community scale who have found a way to create that type of love for one another and to change like people's lives. I think it's not very accessible at the moment because of the way, I mean, technology and capitalism have like totally degraded our interpersonal relationships and our sense of being a member of a community. But I think that's why it's all the more necessary. And I think I'm like, I start to see it coming back, that sense of community and that sense of intention and care. 
That's an amazing point that it is really possible with smaller communities, maybe because of the smaller, you know, breadth, but also because even if you're a community with like lots of different cultures and different origins, there's a geographical element that still performs like the root, the foundation of it. And you have something to care for together, which is ostensibly like your physical community, right? But you said that like you have experienced that type of power filled love in your life. Do you wanna go into a story about that? I guess this might sound cheesy. And I think when I got out of a bad relationship some time ago, a relationship that really rough kind of left me a huge mess. And my friend Kirby, my friend Mora stepped up and took care of me at that time. And in a lot of different ways, they like spent time with me. They gave me a lot of reassurance and validation and my other friends did as well. But I have this very vivid memory of going over to Kirby's apartment in Baltimore or the house she was living in. And she made me dinner and it was like her and Mora and her roommate. And we were like talking and they let me be as dramatic as I wanted and to cry. And, but it was like these, these acts of care where they like made food for me and they made sure that I was eating because that's something I struggle with when I'm stressed or upset. Physically, like they sat down and like put their arm around me, let me talk about what I want. And like the sense of safety that create they created in that space of like knowing that I could be like fully vulnerable and that this is a place where like I could just like let myself feel the hurt I was feeling and that I would be supported to that was like that's a memory that has stayed with me for a really long time and that's something that like in that moment and like since then I've often thought to myself like when I want to create a space or like when I think about my friendships I want to create an environment like that memory that I have. Did that experience or their actions because the experience didn't just spring forth right like they created that experience for you did they give you power in some way? They gave me kind of the space to feel what I was feeling, which was important, but they also kind of gave me, by example, the idea of like what I want to be for others and like the realization that I I could do that. Like, I mean, obviously I wasn't in the position to create that environment in the moment, but like since then I've thought about like, what are ways I can give that to, to like other people? That's a really good example. It really ties into the article about Little Women and like Greta Gerwig's Little Women specifically. Like I loved it because I agree. Like sometimes you just need somebody to tell you like, like, yes, like I'll take you seriously, you know? Yeah. Um, someone Sometimes like your perfect partner is just somebody who helps you live your life better. And of course that's with the caveat that like you are helping them live their life better as well. So this Quran Shev reading also emphasized that like, like love is a great place to get like positive emotion. I think it's interesting that like sometimes you're, when we feel no love, we take refuge in other people's love. I guess it's not interesting. I guess that makes perfect sense, <laughs> right? I was really interested in what Quran Shev had to say about like the difference between romantic and passionate love, because people really do conflate the two or people idealize and obsess over someone and think that is love when it really, it is not at all. And also tying it mm-hmm. back to last week's episode with Bell Hooks and what she said about love being a choice and an action. That's something that's really resonated with me. And I've always felt that like with my romantic relationships, I mean, what makes them valuable is that if you love someone, you love them enough to work through the difficult times. And like to make the decision to stay and to stick it out and try and like build something better. Obviously, this doesn't apply in like abusive situations. And at some point, you have to have like boundaries and like, you know, say enough is enough. But like, that's something that I've always believed very strongly is even when you don't feel love, like, you don't like you're angry with them or you're frustrated and you can't remember all like the good things from the honeymoon period or whatever working through that is what makes the love valuable. Yeah, I because it's a bundle of choices, right? You know, as much as I agree with that and as much as I respect like a balanced love, it's still a struggle for me to say that there is such a humanly rational conception of love that it should also be simple for you to know when to walk away from it. It's almost like if you see love as a an irrational obsession 
then it is really simple to walk away as soon as it stops being the ideal, right? But if you see love as like a series of choices, it almost complicates the walking away. Then the walking they, away has to be a feel thing. It has to be like a intuition thing. Like, oh, I don't think we're going to get past the next, the next choice. I mean, that is something that has kind of been my downfall is my eternal optimism. Susan Sontag wrote this quote that really, really resonated with me. Um, I remember reading it like years ago and like I think about it all the time. She wrote, I don't want to learn anything from this love. What I could learn is to become cynical or guarded or even more afraid of loving, loving than I was before. I don't want to learn anything. I don't want to draw any conclusions. Let me go on being naked. Let it hurt, but let me survive. I think about that often. There's a little paragraph in the Quran Deshev reading that was really interesting to me because I think I have that same like optimism as you. Like I really think that, you know, love can be a defining part of my life experience and it's what I want, romantic love specifically. You know, maybe my opinion will change in the future, but right now I like really want to experience like like a love of depth. And so this paragraph in the Quran Deshev reading, it's, it has a subtitle, love is an empowering emotion. People dismiss love as being an emotion or a fleeting thing and that like companionship is the real deal or whatever. But you can't, you can't say that love doesn't inspire people. Like love doesn't move people. Love doesn't make people like do things that they wouldn't be able to do before or wouldn't have the courage to do before. The Quran Deshev reading says, Thousands of novels and romances throughout history have provided multiple evidences of the belief that strong, passionate love can overcome any obstacle or that, like that, that that belief is held by a lot of people. People in love feel resilient physically and psychologically in many other regards. They are more positive to other people, often more creative, tend to write poems. They can do much more for the beloved than for any other person in their relationship. Love brings them more power. This is an interesting conundrum, right? Like, love gives us power, but at what cost type of thing? <laughs> it's so at odds with, like, what I've learned about being kind. I think, you know, it takes real patience and kindness for your friends Kirby and Mora to have provided that space for you, made you dinner, and, like, set out with the intention, like, okay, this night is about Catherine, you know? That takes more than just, like, crazy love for you. This isn't directly a response, but it makes you think of, like, something you said to me a while ago about like learning how to love someone effectively a we're not really strangers card that like they posted on their Instagram story that was like is there someone in the, your life who does a really good job of loving you and I thought about that because that's also kind of a misconception is that we will instinctively know how to love someone in the best way when you're in love with someone and when they love you back you will know how to make it like you'll you'll just know how to make it work you know how to express it, how to make sure they feel that love, like how to mm -hmm. be empathetic. And like, you don't know those things. Those are skills you have to learn in general, but also with each individual person, you have to learn the specific things to love them in the best way possible. And that takes like patience and like so much care to understand what someone needs and to love them enough to do it. Yeah, and on the flip side, it actually made me feel a little more grateful when there was effective love shown toward me because I realized that like, you know, we can't all just focus at all times on caring for people. I think that was more of like a middle school, high school thing. But now when we're adults, like you have so many other responsibilities that you're dividing your attention among and you're really just trying to help your friends and look out for your loved ones as much as you can, like as much as you stumble across it. And so I've even learned to be grateful for when like a, the stumbling of a friend matches up with what I need. I, it's almost like just a gratefulness to like the universe as opposed to like a gratefulness to my friend. I don't know. I just stopped really holding my friend's inabilities to meet my like love needs against them. It, I just think it's so hard. Like it's so hard to like be what somebody needs. It, you can definitely show them love, both sides appreciating each other from across kind of this understanding divide but it just makes it that much more meaningful when something makes it over that that's something I've come to accept like you said like not holding it against my friends like when they say something that frustrates me or like when they're not able to be there for me when I'm upset 
like instead of taking it as a personal slight like things happen like I know I've also done those exact same things to my friends so like who am I to be bitter that you know that they weren't able to be there for me and for me that reinforces like the need to have like a lot of friends the need to have a broad like social circle not like you know hundreds of people or like whatever but I mean like you need to understand that like no one person or no like two or three people is really going to be adequate to mm-hmm. be able to support you and to have a strong support ne- network for when you are in those moments of crisis and really, really need help. And that's a failing that I think trips up a ton of romantic relationships is because like Karan Dishev says, people expect romantic love to be the end all be all. And they expect their partner to kind of like fix everything for them. Like we're kind of sold this idea of your romantic partner is going to be the one, your best friend like the only person you need and it's like that's just not no like <laughs> no one person is really going to be able to give you everything you need I've been you know mulling over lately the idea that your friends impact your life more than your partner and like you can have multiple life partners you know like you can have friends who you decide to embark on that like, we are going to be partners for life like we're going to make this work you know because we're both people that could benefit from like a lifelong relationship and lifelong support of one another. And if you can choose your romantic life partner at when you're 20, then why couldn't you choose your friends at age 20? You know, I'm sure it changes a little when you have kids maybe, and then your priorities obviously shift very drastically towards like your family and the family unit, but still, like, you know, I've been entertaining that question, like, what would happen if I took my friends really seriously? Like, if I devoted the same amount of, like, care and carefulness as I do to my romantic relationship? And, like, how much, you know, joy could that bring me? And how much support I would be creating for myself, right? I think I always, I always feel guilty. Like, I feel like I'm a very selfish person in friendships. I always feel like I ask a lot out of my friends. Is that like a passing thought or is it like a role that you are comfortable in? It's something I'm actively like trying to change. Oh. And I think it also varies from like friend to friend. Like there are some friends whom I find myself taking care of them, to, you know, or supporting them more than vice versa. And then there are like some friends who I like, I find myself like I reach out to them often when I'm stressed or in crisis and they like, you know, provide me all this support and advice, but like, I realize that very rarely are those roles reversed. I mean, not that I want them to be in a time of crisis, but, you know, that's one of my, like, intentions for the 2021 is I told myself is, like, I want to do a better job of, like, supporting the people who have supported me or, like, Mm -hmm. finding a way to let people know how, like, how grateful I am for the support they gave me. Yeah, finding the way is really key because it for me, like it's really hard for me to talk about stuff that I'm actively going through. I'm just not a verbal processor. And I really, I, I heard a phrase today in a podcast. It was like, show your scars, not your wounds. Only publicize something that you process and you have a healthy relationship with as opposed to like broadcasting it as it goes. Obviously that doesn't like, that's not in regards to like your actual friends. It's more as to like on social media or something like that. But I don't know. And I think like, I know that it's my fault that fault is like a blame laden word, but it's hard for people to naturally find a way to like comfort me or like be there with me through something. Yeah, that used to like cause me a lot of pain in like high school. But now I I just like, I just realized like, it's really hard. (laughs) I used to be so frustrated. I was like, why can't my friends be there for me? And then and knowing like it's harder and still knowing like I still deserve somebody to be there for me right at some point I was like you know what it's okay like I can I can handle it like (laughs) and I can also rely on myself to share those things after if they really still have been significant in my life the follow-up question is like when has been a time where your love the love that you showed transferred power to somebody I mean I don't know if this is truly powerful, but here's hoping he never sees this. But when my dad was unemployed up until very recently, unemployed for the, he was, he's in his fifties, like late fifties. He was unemployed for the first time in his life since he was 14 years old. Like my dad has always worked 
and it's been a big part of his identity also like traditional white american male of group brain is like you know you work you provide and he's always done that he was laid off because of covid he wasn't like visibly upset or angry about it he was disappointed but like the stress and like the tension he was so down like he seemed very like like you could see him like floundering like he didn't really know what to do with himself really, you know and he was so frustrated with the job hunt and so we this is very goofy but like we just we watched tv together we watched the entire series cheers from like start to finish mm-hmm. and just like to spend time and kind of like even though it's kind of mindless to do something that made him laugh and like me up like made him happy and like spend quality time together and like just kind of have a distraction from the stress and i could tell it was something that like cheered him up a lot and it also was a good tv show but <laughs> no definitely power you know we think of it as dominion for some reason but when we talk about being empowered as an adjective as opposed to the noun form we think of like more grounded or more able or re-energized I remember I had a, a dream a long time ago where I was facing down my my ex-boyfriend the one who was really really awful to me and in the dream he was with this new girl and he was standing in front of me and he was like yelling at me about like how she was prettier and like better and just like how awful and stupid I was like I don't know one of those weird stress dreams but like in my dream yeah. my my in my dream my that my partner at the time was like standing behind me and like I couldn't see him in the dream like I couldn't look towards him but I could feel that like he had put both of his hands on my shoulders and I just like I felt so much calmer in the dream, like, even though my, like, shitty ex was, like, yelling at me in the dream, instead of feeling, like, fear, I was just, like, I'm okay, like, I have someone behind me, and, like, that's, I think that visual has stuck with me, like, when I think about supporting someone, it's not fixing it for them, but giving them what they need so that they feel empowered in their own agency. Your dreams are, like, not even metaphorical are like I go to a spa and like I had this dream last night I went to a spa but like all of my family friends were there like every single one that has ever made me feel awkward and like not know what to say and for whatever reason I couldn't open my eyes so I fell like full face in the three foot part of it and I was like lying there and my whole body was out I think that like is a big thing because like I was I was told so much to like cover up and stuff when I was a teenager so my whole body was like visible to all my family friends and I like couldn't open my eyes and I was like trying to get out (laughs) well I could talk about stress dreams for days I have a lot of nightmares like a lot I recently cracked a filling in my tooth because I grinded it in my sleep (laughs) and I had to get a redone anyways (laughs) I have so much responsibility in my dreams. Do you think that says something about me? I mean, (laughs) I think you have a lot of faith in your, like, rightfully so, you have a lot of faith in your own intelligence and your power to, like, see situations clearly and kind of cut to the truth of what matter. I mean, that's a quality I admire in you, is, like, you're very good at being, like, the neutral observer of a situation and like giving the honest advice whether or not it's what people want to hear so I feel like you're often called upon to like fix things or like to give an answer maybe my dreams are telling me that I can't I can't do it (laughs) (laughs) maybe your dreams are telling you that sometimes you can't you cannot fix it I don't know yeah I mean actually I wish that people saw me as like way more biased in their favor like I love when your friends will bully somebody like when it's just the two of you (laughs) like for no reason like they have no beef with that other person but they're like talking so much smack about them like for no reason at all like I love that I think it's such a harmless like fun like it's like a toxic light you know it's like it's like toxic just for girls (laughs) yeah I was just gonna say that's something I found but like I do kind of generally enjoy like gossiping a little that's like <laughs> it's an American pastime, man. It's mm-hmm. I've just gotta talk a little shit. Yeah, and I like totally justify myself by saying, well, I'm sure there's plenty of people who talk shit about me. Like 
I don't know. I just feel like I kind of give that vibe. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Like, I totally get it. You know, I'm not going to call them out or even think badly of them if they're super nice to me in person or something. Like, I just get it. Like, you got to like, yeah, you have an, you need to have an outlet. You know? Yeah, it's also, yeah. Like, it's totally valid to be frustrated with someone. But I also like, I'm not going to create unnecessarily con- unnecessary conflict by being like rude or impolite to someone. I don't even think the conflict is really there because it's kind of just a small problem you have with a version of them. Like sometimes even with your close friends, like you got to talk shit about them in order to keep loving them, you know? Yeah. Like there's often two levels to things. Yeah. Like a like a light just for girls level. <laughs> then like a, we have a problem and we need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I love... I mean, this is not even a side tangent, right? Like the love that exists between women, like the affection that can exist between women. And I guess people who are non-binary or genderqueer, although I wouldn't have any like, you know, direct experience with that. So I really don't know if this type of dynamic exists, but for girls, right? Like there's such a, like a superficial love um, where it's, but it's like so genuine, right? Like, there's nothing fake about it. It's just, it's just very thin in nature. Girls, because we're so used to this whole charade and this performance of like femininity, and especially because so much of that performance is like tied up in our relationship to other girls, and I feel like we're able to play with that performance a lot, and that's like mm-hmm. kind of what's fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. The play is really important because you know, like the application of like. Foucault's panopticon to like gender well the panopticon can be applied to like lots of things but it's like the idea that it's like a perfectly round jail where oh, yeah. the cells are on the circular wall and there's a guard there's a prison guard in the middle and he the guard can see out at anyone and observe anyone at any time but it's like mirrored or whatever so none of the prisoners can see when the guard is looking at them so over time, the prisoners learn to sort of self, self-govern, self self-regulate their behavior. Mm-hmm. And so that's like Foucault's idea of the society and applied to gender. It's like women have this internalized male gaze. Yeah, the male gaze. Male fantasies, like, male fantasies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the internalized male gaze where it's like, even if there's no one watching them, there's no man watching them, there's no any type of person watching them they're performing femininity that's why some people put makeup on in the morning even if it's not for them even if they don't enjoy it because they feel like they're going to be punished if they don't it's very subconscious and conscious and you know constantly on a loop at all times I brought that out for a bigger point playing with uh the feminine performance yeah because we are self-governing self-regulating the whole time it's not really a performance it's like we're 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 being te- we're testing at all times so a performance in that sense and you know you gotta have recess at some point and so yeah um that's a lot of women's arguments for like sexualizing themselves is that well now that we learn to enjoy the regulation the self-regulation people are mad that's like yeah. one viewpoint on the women's self-sexualization this brings me back to good memories of like me and my roommates in Baltimore. Like one night, my roommate Paige had never seen Legally Blonde, so we like got some Ooh, wine. Legally we like Blonde. made some brownies. <laughs> we watched Legally Blonde. It was great. Okay, we have to dress up. You should be Reese, the character, and I should be <laughs> Vivian. Yes. <laughs> the brunette versus blonde. The visual representation of the Madonna versus the horror. In Mad Men, Jackie and Marilyn. Okay. Legally Blonde is a fantastic representation of love. Like her, like her female friendships and the network that she just instinctively builds because she's so caring and generous to the people around her. It's incredible. It goes back to something I was discussing in last week's episode about how like lo- self-love sometimes takes a part of selfishness within relationships. Like you gotta know when to rely on somebody else's care for you. Just because Reese Witherspoon's character is focused on herself and her image and her like advancement doesn't it completely does not preclude her from caring fully about other people. Yeah, and that's such like a servitude role that has been put on a lot of like saintly Madonna-esque women characters 
is that they have to be self-sacrificing. They have to give everything and give all, you know, and there's kind of a, a reclamation. It's a much easier to do a reclama- reclamation of the horror version of like, no, be selfish, like be a girl boss, whatever. But the point is that they're not ex- <laughs> they're not exclusive, you know, they're not. Yeah. Exclusive. Like you cannot pour from an empty cup, like whatever that phrase is, mm-hmm. you know, more specifically, it's through Elle Woods her focus on herself that she's best able to help her friends like it's because she focused on herself and went to law school and like advanced herself that she was able to help help her friend get her dog back from her like Mm -hmm. shitty ex what another mistake that people put on that is that they assume it has to be chronological like you have to pour into yourself before you pour into another person but sometimes you have like enough to give like sometimes you have enough to like give 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 and then like you're like oh I'm kind of tired maybe I should focus on myself a little bit you know it's it's really not who do you protect first like you don't have to make a hierarchy because just as like it's a very natural thing for you to go about your life caring about people you care about and then also to do for yourself what you need to do for yourself and I would say that the picture perfect ending of of L ending up best friends with Vivian is a form of play like it's a form of playing with that material of like women's love and women's caring women's friendship like uh, like that would never happen like I'm sorry I don't Uh, know I think it would (laughs) I I mentioned my crappy ex I knew his girlfriend before me Uh, I knew her from actually from kindergarten and from high school still like chat and like talk we're not super close friends because we live in very different places Um, and like I said we drifted apart after like high school so also another girl who he was also really crappy to like the three of us have like <laughs> we still like talk and like connect from time to time and we're like you know you talk about him once or twice we've talked about him but like actually not really no yeah a tacitly um, understood camaraderie <laughs> okay then maybe I stand corrected but it like to the, the fact that rom-coms even have like such shiny wrap it up with a bow endings is a form of I think play with feminine material well I haven't watched that many rom-coms but I love a good rom-com like I love a good thing that is just what it is um I'm in this like book club and we read this book where the ending is really like way too neat um like a girl marries the guy and they like are perfectly well off like suddenly the guy owns a garage so he can like finance their life because the girl is like pregnant and stuff and it's just like I can enjoy that for what it is like as much as the world falls apart like in every single way <laughs> you know political hierarchical whatever like it's, as things come un- unraveled not just in a bad way but in a way that is simply destabilizing I still for whatever reason like really hold on to like a very Disney-esque idea of love and I wonder why that is it's almost even a question of like in all of this like freedom of individualism and stuff why are we still holding on so hard to the idea of like monogamous bliss you know what is the appeal that love intrinsically holds for us romantic love I think the cultural concepts that we have of like romantic love like you said the Disney style I mean it's the like happily ever after without complications like it's the rom-com ending and I feel like that's why we often hold on to it because when so many things are not going the rom-com way we hope that like this last one will but there's there are so many people who are so rational so smart so able to take care of themselves you know like I don't know maybe they don't maybe they don't hold on to like a happily ever ever or, or like they don't lack for happily ever after type of love I think it's also because we've been taught that romantic love is like so distinct from our like platonic love from our community love and like communal love and also because we lack our communal love so we look for it in a romantic outlet because we're not getting it in other outlets I guess a lot of times when people get married and have kids they like join some sort of community like often religious or I don't know they join like a tennis club or something I'm not sure um and for whatever reason even that type of love is I think prioritized above the drama that it can bring to people's lives above like the superficialness of the love you know 
like why do we fight so hard to like feel part of something even if it's uncomfortable or it can like literally bring like the worst traumas of your whole life like you know (laughs) anything from like someone gossiping about you to like completely wrecking your entire life like all of that can happen we gotta participate in this world so I think we just try and pick what we hope is the best place to participate in yeah I uh, like that's true but we also make so many compromises people do stuff based on the time they have or the convenience I don't know do you have some final thoughts on love to wrap it up it's then they'll be all (laughs) <laughs> it is <laughs> not romantic love but uh love in general i agree but like why do i agree with that <laughs> no. this has been the second week's episode of the february calendar for read community i'm ryan i'm Catherine, and we hope you follow us on youtube spotify apple podcast rate review like save follow share and <laughs> we will see you next week Bye. How's your headache?